Good evening, everyone, and thanks for that. Uh, thanks for your patience during that slight delay. You know why uh, we <laughs> had it, uh, and we're all set to go. Um, I have the job tonight uh, and the pleasure tonight of introducing uh, someone who needs no introduction, really. Uh, Professor David Shambaugh, as many of you know, uh, is one of uh, America's and the world's leading uh, China watchers. Uh, he is recognized uh, for his, uh, I would say, candor, uh, paid close attention to uh, for his writings and analysis in both the corridors of power and elsewhere in Washington, D.C. and in Beijing. Uh, sometimes officials in both of those capitals may not like uh, what they read or hear uh, from his analysis, uh, but they certainly pay very close attention to, to everything uh, that he publishes, and he has published a great deal. Most recently, uh, what we'll be hearing about tonight is uh, China's Future, which I think uh, is, is a book that has a, a title that may have a question mark at the end of it. It certainly is uh, prominent there on, on the cover, um, and we're in for a real treat uh, because this, uh, this book, copies of which are available over here uh, before, well, I should say during and after, but let's wait till after, uh, and I'm sure he'd be happy to sign a copy uh, after you purchase it tonight. Um, th this is uh, really, I think, a, a kind of uh, our chance to hear his take on the many developments that have been going on uh, in, in Beijing, in China, uh, in the last year or so. Uh, the book is, is, is 2016 with Polity Press and contains much up-to-date uh, information, obviously. Um, I will also uh, just uh, do the, the, the normal background information. He is professor of political science and international affairs and director of the China Policy Program at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, uh, a position that he moved to uh, uh, prior to that. Anyway, he was a reader in Chinese politics at the University of London's School of Oriental and African Studies and was editor of the China Quarterly. Um, he will be uh, a visiting professor uh, next year at the uh, Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. Uh, and as many of you know, and as many of you who have read his, his contributions, he is um, a scholar who is a publicly engaged uh, intellectual, uh, frequent uh, contributor to various international media, uh, both electronic and print, uh, and of course websites, uh, been a consultant to various governments, research institutions, foundations, uh, and is uh, finally, I'll say, a, a prolific author the, the author of, of three, over 300 uh, articles and 30 books. I suppose this is number 30. Uh, maybe it's number 31, depending on the, the date of my bio here. <laughs> but uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor David Shambaugh. Well, good evening, everybody, and th uh, thank you for coming. I appreciate it very much, and thank you, Mark, for your very uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, let me just get the computer situated here. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here at the New School, um, and I want to thank you, Mark, for inviting me and, and to the um, India-China Institute for hosting uh, tonight's uh, book launch lecture. Anyway, thank you really uh, very much for coming, and I want to thank the Institute for hosting uh, this lecture, and Ambassador Rao um, for being the commentator on, on my talk tonight, and I'd like to acknowledge, finally, uh, somewhere in the audience, my son Christopher is here, uh, there he is, um, who I want to thank for coming to hear his dad talk, but more importantly, uh, he's a student here at the New School. So, <laughs> um, getting his master's degree. So, uh, thanks to all of you for, for turning out. Um, while I appreciate that you're all, you probably came this evening hoping for a nice, simple answer to the question, um, what is China's future? I'm gonna dis going to disappoint you. Um, there's a reason for the question mark on, on the cover. Um, uh, I would not be so naive as to either try and provide one simple answer to China's future. Um, uh, there is no simple answer uh, to China's future. Uh, none of us know. 
Uh, this is an incredibly complex subject, but needless to say, one of the uh, key ones in international affairs. Um, and it's also one of the more hazardous subjects, I should say, for sinologists and, and others who watch China um, to try and uh, analyze um, the landscape you might, the sinological landscape one might say is littered with a number of individuals' uh, predictions that were not realized or questionable assumptions, um, unanswered questions, and I dare say a few tarnished reputations. So wandering into this terrain, into this space of trying to even discuss China's future can be professionally hazardous. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon us, whether we're China specialists or India specialists or America specialists or any other kind of specialist, to try and wrestle with the complexities of the country um, that is the object of our study. After all, if we don't understand uh, those countries um, and cannot try and exp you know, discuss at least and elaborate the variables at play in a given country at a given time, who can? So I think it's professionally incumbent upon uh, academics uh, to uh, undertake such an exercise. At the same time, we've got to be quite, I think, humble as to our predictive capacities. Nobody has a crystal ball. In fact, China watching today is a lot like, brings to mind the ancient Indian fable of the three blind men who feel the elephant, right? And each one thinks they're feeling a different uh, beast. They're feeling a different part of the beast, but they think they're feeling a different beast. Actually, that might make a very good logo for the India-China Institute. <laughs> it just occurred to me, the three blind men and the elephant. But China today is indeed so filled with contradictions and complexities um, that it defies uh, prediction. In fact, in the 40 years or so that I've been watching and studying China, I've never had a greater sense of uncertainty about the country and fragility in the country. One just has a sense that it's a kind of volcano with a lot of churning under the surface that you can't really see, but you can sort of feel. And if you talk, you know, visit China and you speak with Chinese, um, one finds at least anecdotal evidence of that. So I think the best we can do as analysts is to carefully study uh, available data work with multiple sources, both inside of China and outside of China, in Chinese language and other uh, languages, um, identify the principal variables that are at work in that country and, and to some extent the trajectories of those variables and indeed the intersection of those variables. Um, and lastly, and perhaps most importantly, to view China through a comparative lens. If I'm going to give you one takeaway tonight, it is to view China through a comparative lens. China is, I like to say, may be distinct, but it is not unique. It is experiencing many of the same uh, challenges and issues that all newly industrializing economies um, experience at a certain stage of development as they enter the so-called middle income trap. and they, the Chinese political system is a Leninist type um, political, authoritarian political system. Uh, Leninist political systems are a subtype of authoritarian systems. So, uh, and they too have a, as I'll explain this evening, they have their own rather predictive life cycles, if you will, and stages of evolution. So China is not unique. And I think that if we apply comparative metrics and comparative perspectives to, um, to studying China today, it will help illuminate some of the potential pathways um, forward and the develop, potential development of, of that country. It's also instructive, I think, to bear in mind Chinese history. Um, China has been around for a very long time, it has passed through many dynasties, and there are very rather predictable patterns in those dynastic cycles particularly in the declining phase of dynastic cycles that I think are also illuminating. So as China analysts, we've got to work with a number of perspectives kind of simultaneously. Um, but to work with the um, only the sinological perspective, seeing China only qua China is not going to get us 
um, very much value added, I don't think. So with this kind of admonition, I, I try and let me briefly describe the book and how I try and apply uh, these different perspectives to uh, China's current contemporary uh, condition and what it might uh, mean for uh, the future. Um, so China, it's no secret that it's had a series of key turning points um, in the last few years. Um, after more than three decades of successful, uh, dramatically successful economic reforms, social reforms, and for a while, even political reforms, it's reached a number of junctures since about 2007 or eight. Uh, in its economy, with respect to its society, its political system, its environment, technology, intellectual um, development, national security, foreign policy, and other areas of development. No matter which sphere you look at, there are diminishing returns have set in. Um, the diminishing returns of the developmental model that Deng Xiaoping launched in 1978 is, is running its course. It hasn't hit the wall, it hasn't completely run its course, but it is uh, reach diminishing returns, that's no secret. Indeed, um, it is widely recognized by both China watchers um, and Chinese leaders. Uh, and they all recognize that change is required. Um, even China's leaders, as I say, are fairly uh, transparent about this, fairly honest in some of their public discourse, more you know, previous to the recent period, but the last premier, uh, Wen Jiabao, um, is uh, rather famous for having bluntly described in his last year in office in 2011, uh, he bluntly described the nation's economy as being characterized by what he called the four uns, uh, unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. That's the premier of the country, the man in charge of the Chinese economy unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. That's pretty damning. Then his successor, Li Keqiang, the current premier, also offered a fairly dire assessment last year in 2015, uh, and I quote again, China's economic growth model remains inefficient. Our capacity for innovation is insufficient. Overcapacity is a pronounced problem, and the foundation of agriculture is weak, unquote. Um, then we have the current uh, preeminent leader, I guess we should call him, Xi Jinping, who late last year in 2015 also lamented, quote, the tasks that our party faces in reform, development, st and stability are more onerous than ever, and the conflicts, dangers, and challenges are more numerous than ever. So even China's leaders, this is not just foreign China watchers, even China's leaders evince the view that the nation has faces a number of really pretty severe challenges and is at a seri series of key turning points. So that's what this book is about, um, the challenges and, and the turning points. And there are functional chapters in it on um, the Chinese economy, China society, China's polity, uh, and China's role in the world. So uh, time does not uh, suffice to kind of run through each of those functional chapters in any detail. What I'm going to do instead is to um, just let you digest a, a little bit what I think some of the major challenges in each of those functional categories are. I'm happy to talk about any of them in more detail when we get to the question and answer period. Um, and one reason for doing this is because I know you're probably most interested in what predictions I have for where China might be headed. Um, so I will uh, give you a few pathways forward, but first let's just sort of walk through these um, a little bit, starting with the economic uh, challenges. Again, I don't want to take time to really run through all these. Many of these are quite familiar to you. Um, you know, declining growth rates, uh, the, the need to shift to a more consumer-driven, service sector-driven, and innovation, above all, innovation-driven economy from the old model of low-end exports plus um, fixed asset investment into infrastructure, right? So the debt problem, by the way, I commend to you this week's uh, issue of The Economist, which has a special feature on China's debt uh, situation, which 
I was worried even before I read it, but having read it last night, <laughs> um, industrial structure reform, labor market hukou reform, financial sector restructuring or lack of it, uh, and so on, capital outflight, innovation. These are not new subjects they're written about, and, um, and there's, but the, each of them in themselves are huge and taken together. One has to sympathize, frankly, with Chinese leadership and Chinese economists for trying to tackle them. Um, and to be fair, they came out with a, a rather uh, sophisticated, comprehensive blueprint on how to tackle them in the third plenum of the uh, 18th um, Central Committee, November 2013, right? The third plenum reform package, 64 categories, 320 odd reforms. Um, very commendable. But I think every analyst of China and the Chinese economy is of the view that there has been minimal implementation of that third plenum reform package two years later, almost three, year, three years later, two and a half years later. You know, less than 10%, in fact, uh, is the general consensus. So uh, there has been no sense of sequencing or, or prioritization and very little movement, frankly, on virtually every one of these with the exception of regulatory streamlining. There, there is some good news. They've slashed 246, I think, uh, state council um, uh, approvals that were needed. Um, they're trying to deregulate part of the economy, but basically all the other bullet points uh, have simply festered and gotten worse in the last two and a half years since the third plenum. Then we have social challenges. Um, which again, you can see for yourself. Uh, many of them are very acute, I would argue, and pretty severe. Um, they uh, have to do with uh, income inequality. That's not a new problem, but China's Gini coefficient is in the top 10, if not the top five in the world. It's in the t certainly in the top five in terms of the uh, growth rate of the Gini coefficient over the last five years. China is becoming more unequal, not less, in the last five years, if I understand the statistics. Um, wages are relatively stagnating. Uh, one really telling factor, I think, it actually says as much about the country politically as it does socially, is the middle class and the upper class are increasingly moving their assets and themselves and their family members abroad in ever-increasing numbers. The political implications of that are pretty clear. When the elite of a country have one foot out the door, it doesn't tell you that they have a whole lot of confidence in the future of their own system. Then you have the, what I call the volatile periphery, by which I mean Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, all four of which have their own uh, uh, challenges, uh, each of which are uh, you know, driven by different factors, but taken together, uh, this is not a very a peaceful periphery, shall we say. Intense repression of civil society, we're all aware of that. The NGO law last week, just more evidence of very, very concerning trends uh, in, in that sphere, um, the pu so-called public sphere, over the last few years, part of which has to do with stricter control of the media, of the educational system from top to bottom, and I mean from poor swa, from nursery school to higher ed. The ban on, on Western textbooks in Chinese universities is part of that. Uh, the urbanization transition, enormous plan, um, which if they succeed by 2020 will have moved, 70% of the population will live in urban areas. Um, but just the magnitude of the plan transition, this is Li Keqiang, the premier's, kind of pet project, right? Um, and it's impressive. The plans are impressive. And it's really uh, going to be interesting to, to watch how that unfolds. Demographic transition, baby boomers retiring, wages rising, um, the implications of that for the next topic, provision of public goods, including pensions, on which Professor Frazier here is the world's leading expert, in fact. Um, You'll find yourself quoted in the book, actually, Mark, in several places. Uh, when it came to pensions, I read everything you've written, uh, learned a lot from it. Environment, energy, and so on. Then we turn to politics. I said I wasn't going to go through these in any great detail, and I really don't want to take too much more time on it. But 
uh, clearly the political system um, is changed since, uh, I would say, since 2009. It doesn't, hasn't changed just since Xi Jinping came to power in 2012. Some of the trends that we have seen since 2009 have deepened <clears throat> and become more intensified since 2012, but I actually predate them uh, to Xi Jinping's um, promotion at the last Congress. Part of that has to do with the anti-corruption campaign, a very good thing to be sure. I'm all in favor of the anti-corruption campaign. Um, it's very needed. It was a, and still is probably, a very widespread, serious um, cancer on the entire uh, Communist Party, on the military, on the, on the government, and on society itself. So there, you know, Xi Jinping deserves a lot of credit for trying to tackle that problem. But the campaign has had a lot of side effects, one of which is the third bullet point. It's produced a, what's described by some scholars as a culture of fear, again, in the society, a frozen policy apparatus, cadres who are not physically going to work or doing their jobs. That's one reason, in fact, the economic third plenum reform program has stalled, I would argue. Um, so you know, the anti-corruption campaign has some good aspects, but also has some collateral side effects that we need to, um, we need to look at. Um, and you can read the rest of them for yourself. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a long litany of indicators about intensified repression. China is more repressive today than it has been at any time since the aftermath of 1989. I know, I lived there in 1989, 1990, 1991. Um, it's not as bad as it now as it was then, but it's as close as it's been now as it, to what it was then, and it is trending in that direction. It can get, as I'll describe in a moment, it can get worse. And then finally, just in the fourth chapter on China's foreign relations, uh, here um, I would describe them as uh, overall mixed on a global basis. Um, but increasingly fraught and complicated and indeed strained. In very few regions would I describe China's foreign relations as unquestionably positive, um, except perhaps in Central Asia and the Middle East. There are two regions where China seems to have pretty good and un, you know, adulterated ties. Everywhere else, though, relations with the European Union, with with Latin America, with African countries, uh, certainly with the United States, and I would argue even with Russia under the surface, and with India, um, and with every country around China's periphery, every single one, including North Korea, China's relations are very strained. Um, well, should this surprise us? No. This is to be expected, I would argue, entirely predictable for a rising power um, and a rising assertive power. China is beginning to flex its muscles, its monetary muscles, its military muscles, and it would like to flex soft power muscles, but as we'll see in a minute, or I don't think China has a lot of soft power um, muscles, despite the investment of about $10 billion a year into this sphere. They're not getting a lot of return for their investment. Hard power, absolutely increasing. The Chinese military and the Navy in particular. Footprint is broadening further and further into the Western Pacific through the Indian Ocean littoral, um, its ballistic missile programs and other conventional weapons programs um, have been steadily building for many years. This is not a crash program, but it's a very steady uh, program that has seen some significant technological advancements that many analysts, myself included, would not have predicted um, 10 or 15 years ago. So the Chinese military, it's fair to say now, is the second or third most capable military in the world, depending on how you compare it with Russia. Certain areas the Russians are more proficient than the Chinese, certain areas the Chinese are more proficient than the Russians, both of them trail behind the United States, but whoever you put in number three is a long way behind. So China, China's military footprint um, increasingly strong. Where I will give China credit on the foreign policy front is in the area of global governance. Here, I think, and since Xi Jinping has come to power, 
we have seen a real uptick of China's participation in several realms of global governance, from climate change to anti-piracy work to fighting pandemics um, and ODA, a uh, number, of, number of things. Now, you will also recall that China had been widely criticized um, by uh, Robert Zellick, for example, in his famous speech in 2005 here in New York City for not being a responsible international stakeholder and by scholars, including myself, for not carrying its own weight, for not punching at its own, punching below its weight, and not contributing to global governance commensurate with the country's resources and potential. Well, I think now, in the last three years, China is pulling its own weight much more and um, is contributing, and its contributions have actually increased, how, however you measure them, financially or otherwise. So that's a kind of good news story. But I would argue that China, as I did in my previous book, is still a partial power that lags significantly behind the United States in global power and influence. Okay, so that's a kind of series of snapshots of the functional chapters in the book. As I say, I'm happy to come back and discuss any of those in the question and answer period. But um, let me spend the rest of the time kind of um, telling you what the core argument of the book is and elaborating that. So China's future um, is not unlike an automobile that is going into a roundabout. And when you go into a roundabout, of course, you have several options. You can come out of the roundabout in different places. Or I suppose you could just continue to go around and around, but that won't get you very far. So the, the, question, is, the question is twofold, really. Which road do you select to come out of, and what road do you come in on, right? all cars enter the roundabout on an established road. Um, so that established road is, as the slide indicates, what I call hard authoritarianism. And it has four choices, as I see it, uh, for coming out of the roundabout. And I'll talk about each of those uh, four um, in, um, in sequence. But the road that China is on now is the path that it has been on since 2008, 2009. That is really a very crucial year in China's internal and external behavior. Uh, a lot of things changed that year, and just coincidentally, I happened to be living there that year. It's right after Ambassador Rao. You, that was the last year of your service as ambassador in, in Beijing. I don't know if you felt these things before the summer of 2009 when you departed, but. Uh, they certainly continued through the end of 2009 into 2010. So during that year, um, China stepped away from the path that it had been on the previous decade, from 1998 to 2008, which was a path of what I would describe as managed and measured political opening. Um, and it reverted to much greater controls over virtually all spheres of life, increased repression, and increased centralization. Um, so the previous 10 years included opening of civil society, uh, relatively greater freedom for the media, for academia, for public discourse and intellectual life, greater freedom of speech and expression, and of course, greater marketization of the economy. Um, that's the path China had been on. So if you did a, a similar slide to this seven years ago, the road coming into the roundabout was soft authoritarianism. But since the change in 2010, 2009, um, they've been on the hard authoritarian path. So the question is, uh, what are the implications of that? And uh, if they stay on that path, if they take the second left-hand turning and stay on the path, what are the impl implications? Or what would happen if they selected one of the other three um, pathways, neo-totalitarianism, soft authoritarianism, or semi-democracy. So if they stay on the current path, in short, I argue that um, there will be limited reform, um, that is to say economic reform. Uh, there will be relative economic stagnation. Uh, and there will be political decline of the party state. Uh, and there will be increasingly acute social problems. If you think back to that slide on the social challenges, each one of those will become worse and worse. Um, the, 
the economic, limited economic reform, this is not to say that they won't implement some of the third plenum package. They are implementing some of the third plenum package. But as I say, it's about 10%. Well, they may be able to get it up to 20, but the vast majority of the third plenum package, which is a very well thought through, comprehensive package, which is, ex it's a good roadmap. The World Bank wrote it for them, right? They didn't come up with it themselves. Uh, or not entirely by themselves. It's all embodied in the 2030, China 2030 report that the World Bank and the State Council did together, right? So um, I will explain in a second why I think staying on hard authoritarian path is going to con produce continued uh, relative economic stagnation. Um, uh, but if they were to, let's, let's consider some of the other uh, possibilities, though. They could um, revert um, to neo-totalitarianism. Let me just say first on the, on the relative stagnation, um, the key word there is relative, right? Why? Because a, a tr $10 trillion economy growing at whatever, you know, three, four, five, or six percent GDP per year um, is still a really significant economy. Uh, so, so that's not a ja that's not Japanese style stagnation, for example. I do not envision Jap Japan style stagnation with uh, negative or minimal growth coupled with deflation. China will grow. The GDP numbers will will be there. The question is how high. And in fact, the higher they are the more it indicates the failure to implement the qualitative economic reforms uh, necessary to navigate through and out of the middle income trap. In other words, if they are fixated, continue to be fixated on GDP numbers and keeping those high for full employment reasons and um, keeping the state owned enterprises afloat and other vested interests, that may indicate actually a relative failure to uh, undertake the qualitative reforms they need to do. Similarly, if they come down, as most newly industrializing countries do, to two or three percent GDP growth, it will be a more positive indicator that they are tackling some of those qualitative uh, challenges. Um, so, um, hard authoritarianism doesn't mean the crash of China, and I want to be very clear here. Uh, I am not, and I repeat, not predicting the collapse of China as some people seem to think I am. Um, I, that was a title chosen by the editors of the Wall Street Journal, the term crack up, which in Chinese translates as bung kui, which is the same thing as collapse, which is the same thing as the, so the term they use for the Soviet implosion. So we have several terms in English for this, but in Chinese there's one term, bung kui. And that has very, very bad connotations uh, in Chinese. What I foresee is not it's not collapse. I see relative economic stagnation, increasingly acute social problems, and progressive decay and decline of the political system. Decline does not equal collapse. Um, it is a progressive process that can take years, even decades. We're talking here, as I say, about a very long-term process. The Soviet Union uh, began its terminal decline when, well, most uh, analysts would say 1964 when Brezhnev overthrew Khrushchev. And the Soviet Union went through a long 27-year period of so-called Brezhnevization, even outlived Brezhnev himself, before the whole system bunquayed in 1991. So, you know, that was almost three decades. Um, so what I'm describing is a similar process of decline uh, in China. Um, so it is uh, not the same thing as collapse. It may lead to collapse over time, as it did in the case of the Soviet Union, um, or it can just continue in this kind of st relatively stagnant um, course that China is on. Now, that's fine. If it stays on the relatively stagnant course, um, China's going to have a lot more problems um, to wrestle with. It won't have tackled the uh, key challenges that were on those first few slides. So what about the other three alternatives, quickly? Conceptually, we have to consider the possibility of what I call neo-totalitarianism. It could get worse than it is today, ladies and gentlemen, the repression, that is. 
Uh, it's pretty severe right now, and it's getting worse by the day. It is trending in that direction. But for three reasons, I don't think it will return to the 1989-90 uh, period. Uh, first is the private sector of the economy is already too deeply entrenched and is, in fact, the growth engine of the entire economy. Um, a number of statistics that I could give you that would uh, support that conclusion, but just read Nick Lardy's latest book, Markets Over Mao. The private sector is booming in China and is driving GDP growth, um, consumer spending, service sector, and so on. Uh, you can't put that genie back into the bottle, I don't think. Second reason is that the citizenry, I, would, I, I think, would resist and perhaps revolt if the relative freedoms that they've known over the last 40 years were rolled back like they were in the wake of 1989. We're seeing some signs of this resistance in recent months. Um, and the third reason that I don't think neo-totalitarianism is a realistic option, it's a conceptual possibility, is that elements of the party and the military would not necessarily endorse such a revisionist change of national course. And these two key institutional pillars of power, party and military, would therefore split. And if they split, then there are unpredictable consequences in China. So even though um, this is a conceptual possibility that could grow out of the failure of hard authoritarianism, there would be a series of hardline leaders who would come to the fore uh, and say, we've got to really crack down even further on our society. I don't think it would work. It would, in fact, maybe produce really unintended consequences. Third alternative is soft authoritarianism. OK, so that as I say, had been the path China was on for the decade 98 to 08, uh, engineered by a man named Zheng Ching Hong, the right-hand man of Jiang Zemin. And you must credit Jiang Zemin, too, with supporting the soft authoritarian path. Um, he was the leader of the country. Zheng Ching Hong was, I think, by the time he stepped down, vice president of the country, third highest ranking member of the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau. Um, and it, you know, former uh, head of the organization department, he was a very powerful individual. He had to retire in 2008 for reasons of age. Um, but he had been uh, overseeing this decade-long managed incremental opening. Why? Because there were two big conclusions the Chinese drew from the collapse of the Soviet Union. They spent a lot of time I can tell you, because I studied it in my previous book, studying the collapse of the Soviet Union and Eastern European communist states, and they came to two conclusions, two competing camps, actually, in China. One camp said, well, um, by the time Gorbachev came along with his reforms, the Soviet system was so broken and so brittle and so fragile that it collapsed under the shock therapy. They couldn't take Gorby's reforms. And this camp in China actually said Gorby's reforms were correct. They were essentially Khrushchevite reforms and Dropov-like reforms, but the system was too broken and it shattered. It couldn't, couldn't absorb it because they were not implemented incrementally, okay? So they, their conclusion was you have to open the system, you have to manage that opening from above, and you do it step by step incrementally. It is feasible to do that. So that was school number one. Zhong Ching Hong is the exemplar of that school. That's what they were doing, as I say, from 1995, maybe, all the way to 2008. School number two said, no, 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 managed opening is impossible. It will cascade out of your control, or out of our control, our being the party, and we will fall from power. You cannot manage change in civil society and media and give people freedoms because they want more. <laughs> and that will, as I say, you'll lose control, so don't even go there in the first place. That, was the second school. And guess what? In 2009, school number two came uh, to the fore. Why? Th three or four reasons, briefly, if you're interested. Personalities. They matter in China. Zheng Ching Hong had to retire. There was no patron to continue to guide the soft authoritarian path. Number two, events, starting with Charter 08, followed by the uprisings in Tibet, followed by in the spring of 08, followed by the uprisings in Urumqi in the spring of 09, um, followed um, by Liu Xiaobo <laughs> and the um, Nobel Peace Prize issue in the fall of 09, the um, 
jazz, the Arab Spring Jasmine Revolution in 08, 09. And, and so there were some circumstantial issues that strengthened the hand of the second faction that I just described. And there's big money, by the way. This faction wasn't just a kind of ideological faction. They, their bureaucratic uh, sources, what I call the Iron Quadrangle, the propaganda system, the internal security system, the military, and the state-owned enterprises. Those four very well-funded, politically very strong bureaucracies in China came together in a coalition and said, no more managed incremental change from above. We have to crack down. And guess what? There's big money in repression. So they got their, their coffers. <laughs> All four of those entities got a lot of investment from the state. OK, so you may wonder, why 09? What happened in 08, 09? Well, that's my assessment of what happened. And I lived through it. It was very interesting to kind of witness. OK, so the fourth, so they could go back if they wanted to, you know, theoretically, to soft authoritarianism. I don't, and there is a school of thought that says Xi Jinping is just cracking down before he opens up. Next party Congress, he will have crack down the anti-corruption campaign, then he will be, you know, we'll see a new Xi Jinping. He'll take off his cloak and, and we'll see the reformist Xi Jinping come to the fore. There is that school of thought circulating out there. I do not subscribe to that. I think what we have been seeing from Xi Jinping is the real thing and we're gonna get more of it. Um, there's a second uh, school of thought that argues that the next party Congress next year, we could witness a power struggle between the soft authoritarians who remain in the Politburo. Mind you, there's gonna be a lot of personnel changes next year. 13 of 25 Politburo members are gonna to have to step down for reasons of, of age requirements. Leaving the 12 individuals, if you examine them individually one by one, about eight of them have had very progressive, soft authoritarian backgrounds in the provinces prior to uh, the last party Congress. Um, they could produce a kind of coalition, soft authoritarian coalition, that uh, might challenge Xi Jinping. Uh, that might make for what I call a brokered convention with Chinese characteristics. We'll have to wait and see. And then the fourth pathway, potentially, semi-democracy. Um, what I have in mind here is Singapore, in short. Uh, Singapore writ large, that's not a novel thought. The Chinese themselves have spent a lot of time studying Singapore. Actually, if I had to redraw this diagram, I would have it as a, a new road coming out of soft authoritarianism. I think it evolves out of soft authoritarianism. It's not a, a separate choice, necessarily. So these are the four alternative pathways I see. Uh, these are the consequences of each in this slide. Um, what are the implications for China? Now, I know we got to start a little bit late, Mark, right? But I'll try and bring this to con conclusion. Um, well, it's always easiest for, for, for cars, people, governments to stay on the same course that they've been on. Uh, it's called path dependency in political science. Um, you know, it's, it's the easiest way to muddle through, keep doing what you're doing with incremental adjustments. Why? Vested interests make it so. Unknown consequences are another deterrent. It's very hard to change a nation the size of China. Um, but China has to change if it's going to deal qualitatively with the challenges of being a newly industrializing economy. Let's go back to the comparative perspectives now. China's at a point, this is the so-called J-curve, which is a concept that Ian Bremer of the Eurasia Group here in New York came up with, published a really interesting book on a few years ago. Showed, it examines the relationship between um, stability, social stability and political stability, and openness of a society. Now you can see the dip. Where you want to be if you're a developing or a developed country is on the upper end of the curve, right? The more open a country is, Bremer and a lot of evidence, social science evidence argues, uh, the more stable a country becomes. However, there is this big gulf that you have to go through to get to the upper right-hand end of the curve. Bremer argues that China is very much on the left-hand side of the curve today and is going to have to go through um, some significant tumult. Um, although I think he argues, too, that opening can be managed from above. It is feasible. 
Um, but Bremer or any other social scientist that you read, I would commend to you a book called Why Nations Fail by um, James Robinson and Darren Usamoglu. They argue that you know, all newly industrializing societies have to become inclusive states, they argue, and uh, that facilitate economic activity through opening of society and opening of the political system. The, the point here is the, at this stage of development for China, the relationship between politics and economics is direct. And politics is the independent variable, economics is the dependent variable. Last 30 years, folks, it's been the other way around. Now politics is going to drive the success or failure, relative failure, of China to uh, get through the middle income trap and become an innovative society in particular. Innovation, you have to innovate your way through that trap. It's the only way out. Consumer spending and growth of social sector, or sorry, service sector will help, but it's not gonna do it. You're not gonna move up the value added curve, um, break through the so-called developmental ceiling, um, and become a post-extractive innovative society without political openness. I did not use the word democracy there. But there is not a single case of a newly industrializing economy that has emerged out of the middle income trap, and there are only 11 of 100, according to the World Bank, that have come through, 11 out of 100. That means that 89, the middle income trap, most countries get stuck. They don't get through. Of the 11 that have come through, they've all, most of them went into the trap as an authoritarian country. They all came out as a, some form of a democratic country. So, that's the challenge for China. Um, it's not a secret. This is not new news to social scientists. Since the 1960s, modernization theorists, uh, Lipset, Huntington, Rostow, Organsky, Apter, and others have all identified this necessity. Um, so this is not a, not a secret. And I think modernization theory and the experience of other newly industrialized economies tells us a lot about what to expect um, from China. Then. As I say, we have to look at China as a Leninist-type political system. And there are very predictable phases that all Leninist-type political systems pass through, about seven or eight of these phases that you can see on this slide. Um, the reason there's a question mark at the end is because not a single communist-type Leninist political system has ever succeeded in institutionalizing what's, what Huntington first called adaptation. In fact, I wrote a previous book called China's Communist Party, Atrophy and Adaptation, which was published in 2008, just before the changes I've just described. And I argued then that China was adapting under Zheng Cheng Ho, but they haven't been since. So there's no you know, positive example um, of a Leninist-type political system doing this on any kind of permanent basis. Indeed, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, one of my academic heroes and other wise, uh, in his very prescient book called The Grand Failure. You might have read that or remember that. It was published two years before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, Brzezinski argued that communist party states in this penultimate and moribund phase, and I quote from Brzezinski, he said, in this phase, the communist leadership loses confidence, evinces a deep insecurity, and tries to reassert control. Rule becomes rule for rule's sake. The governing rationale is stripped bare to its core, maintaining power, unquote. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when I look at China today, those words of Brzezinski's seem quite applicable and quite relevant. Um, so, both the modernization theorists and the comparative communism theorists, I think, have a lot to offer us in trying to understand the challenges facing China today, but more importantly, the behavior of the Chinese regime uh, today. These challenges are already beginning to bite. They're very predictable. You study a lot of other newly in industrializing economies, they're all very right there. The World Bank has told China, you don't do A, B, and C, D, E, and F are going to follow. Um, so this is not a secret. It's a pretty con uh, profound dilemma for China. Quite simply, it's not moving ahead politically, and therefore there will be increasing limits on how it develops economically and socially. I did not say collapse. I don't think, it, and I don't want China to collapse. So I want to be clear on that point too. So in conclusion, let me just tie this up. Um, and I look forward to Ambassador Rao's
commentary, there are two general scenarios I see. Um, first, recognize China, China's challenges are uh, unprecedentedly complex, uh, both because of size and the qualitative nature of the challenges, but they're not insurmountable. Um, there are two scenarios. They can go back to soft authoritarianism and, uh, and political reform, which will increase the chances of qualitative economic reforms and social reforms, get out of the middle income trap, and transition towards a mature modern economy, or they stay where they are now, which will produce economic stagnation, aggravated social problems, and political decline. It's pretty simple in my view, maybe overly simple. Uh, but the ultimate question is, does the party have the confidence to open up politically in order to succeed economically and socially? Up until 2009, they seemed to have that confidence. They were adapting, but things shifted, and they are acting in an extremely insecure way today, I would argue, which suggests to me they don't have confidence in their future. They are doing exactly what Brzezinski argued communist parties at this stage of their development do. So with that, let me end my formal comments and uh, look forward to Ambassador Rao's commentary and be happy to take your questions too. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I will, uh, yes, briefly introduce Ambassador Rao, uh, who, who Professor Sambaugh referred to. We're very lucky at the India China Institute. In, in many ways, uh, one of the programs we, we most enjoy is the Visiting Scholar uh, program, which brings to our campus for a month or so uh, distinguished scholars, practitioners uh, from, from China uh, or India, depending on the year. And, and this year, it's just been a, a great uh, intellectual, professional treat to have uh, Ambassador Nirup Nirupama Rao here uh, at the India China Institute. She is, as Professor Shambaugh mentioned, uh, former ambassador of India to the United States from 2011 to 13, and then was India's ambassador to China, as he also mentioned, from 2006 to 2009. She now holds an appointment at the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University, the Brown India Initiative, uh, where she teaches uh, part-time. Uh, and. Uh, her other ambassadorial assignments, I should note, have included uh, postings in Peru, uh, Bolivia, and Sri Lanka. And she has extensive experience, uh, as, as her resume suggests, in looking at relations uh, between India and China. I'm really looking forward to uh, her, uh, the, the project that she's working on with us while she's here, which is a look at Sino-Indian relations from 1949 until 1962. And I'm also looking forward to hearing her reactions to Professor Shambaugh's talk. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador Rao. Um, What's your preference? I can stay here. I think. Okay. Well, that was a fascinating talk. And I think everything you said carries a lot of meaning and relevance uh, for all of us who contemplate the future of China. Coming from India, uh, China is our largest neighbor, and um, everything that happens in China seems to cast a shadow in the region, uh, not the least for us, um, another huge Asian country next door to China, and we've had a troubled relationship with China. Uh, while we call that relationship normalized, at this moment, uh, there has been no conflict uh, on the border we share for over four decades now. The fact is that uh, there are many, many unresolved problems in the relationship. And now, as you mentioned, with China's growing assertiveness, its muscularity, its, uh, its very, uh, you know, well-articulated nationalism, I think uh, you know, we all wonder what the future is going to bring, not only for China, but for all of us in the region. Uh, this is not a situation of helplessness, although I think we watch China very carefully, and, uh, and uh, countries like India are uh, definitely, I believe, growing in strength and influence, and uh, that is going to certainly uh, you know, affect uh, the future equilibrium also. Uh, in, in the region. 
I, um, I have watched China for over three decades now, and I basically agree with your conclusions, Professor Schamburg, on, uh, on the, the political and economic trends in, in China today. And uh, to my mind, everything seems to be predicated uh, on, the, on the survival of the Communist Party of China. Everything they do and say is, is predicated on the need to survive, on the need to sustain themselves, on the need to endure. And th therefore, that really uh, Im impacts the, the prospects for political change uh, in the country. There are many warning signals, as you said, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to the debt ratio to GDP, the overspending and the, and the extravagance that we've seen. Uh, you know, in India, we do things very differently. We're the other end of the spectrum. We, we edge very much towards conservatism when it comes to financial management and uh, our budgetary affairs. Uh, but be that as, as it may, I think uh, China and what happens there uh, impacts all of us, it impacts our destiny, our future, whether it's in the United States or uh, in, in India. And I think today the United States and India with the growth in their, in their uh, bilateral relationship and the fact that we discuss a lot that happens in the region, I think what happens in China is going to be a very much a part of that, uh, of that narrative, of that interface between two of the world's largest democracies. I have a question uh, before we start the discussion uh, with the audience from the book, and this uh, is of special interest to me because I have studied our borders with China for a long time now, and what happens there certainly concerns um, me and you know a lot of uh, scholars like me in, in India. Now you mention at page 91 of the book about the whole question of climate change mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that Himalayan glaciers are melting at a rapid rate, uh, that the prospect has profound and dangerous implications because the glaciers in the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush feed all of seven Asia's greatest rivers, the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, the Mekong, the Salween, the Indus, the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra, and that if there's one transnational environmental issue in India calling out, in Asia, calling out for multinational collaboration, it is this one. I would like you to perhaps dwell a little on this aspect because that really didn't figure in mm -hmm. what you discussed just now, but it's of uh, profound significance uh, for people, and people are at the heart of all this. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Ambassador Rao. Um, I should say Foreign Secretary Rao. She not only served as ambassador to three countries, was also uh, India, India's uh, Foreign Secretary as, as well. Your good question about the um, water resources. Um, you know, we live in an era of so-called transnational security issues. This uh, political scientist called the securitization of everything, basically. But water uh, is recognized to be one of the crucial um, issues, not just in Asia, but indeed even in this country, <laughs> in the western part of the United States, but in, in parts of North Africa. It's, it's a global issue, and um, we're familiar with that. Uh, but uh, because of the uh, rivers running off of the Tibetan Plateau, it involves at least a half a dozen or more countries. And if you include the Indochina countries on, along the Mekong, um, you know, maybe 10 countries. So this is a, an issue tailor-made for multilateral uh, work. I'm aware of at least one uh, non-governmental effort that has governmental support, a classic track two effort that um, is underway, uh, was being led by uh, Professor Catherine Morton and, at the Australian National University, but included scholars from China, Nepal, uh, India, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, um, Laos, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam, I believe. Um, so I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but um, the problem is the dams. The Chinese, it's not just a, a question of, of glacial melt, it's a question of Chinese dam building on the upper reaches of all of these rivers. The Bamaputra, the Irrawaddy, the Salween, uh, they all flow down from Tibet and China's damming a number of those. Um, so, you know, it's like the South China Sea island building 
how are you going to get China to stop building islands and damming the upper reaches of these rivers? I'm not sure, you know, save trying to talk to China, um, that, that, one, that other countries have a whole lot of options, but um, bringing China in is, part, is one way forward. Um, publicizing the issue. There isn't a lot of attention to this issue in the global media that I'm aware of. Um, you know, that will get the world's attention. And it's a multilateral uh, issue. So um, I think there's potential diplomatically here and for track two for, for scholars and for each of these member states to get uh, collectively involved in this issue. But thank you for your kind comments on, on the book. And by the way, there are books available for purchase. Um, I hope we've incentivized you maybe after the talk to go and get one. We just passed Mother's Day yesterday, but Father's Day is still coming. <laughs> it makes a nice gift for your father or your loved one. To take questions from here? Sure, I'm happy to take okay. questions. Uh, or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, if you, yes, first row, yeah. yeah I, oh, and, and we have a ro roaming mic because we're recording, so please, uh, uh, and let me say this before we get started, we get rolling with questions. Uh, this room is famous for uh, some very long and some very short questions, but I want to thank everyone in advance for making your question very short and very to the point. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you can get us off to a great start. Well, what, one of the things about the climate change, I've been very excited about the fact that China was an authoritarian nation because I thought what you, they can do something quicker than anyone else. And the question I have in relation to that is, uh, you spoke about the military and how powerful it is. We use that for ARPANET and all sorts of things. And I want to know how innovative China is in general how well their schools are, how well their universities are, and to what degree you think authoritarianism may help to end climate change? That's an interesting um, way of, of asking the question. Um, essentially, I argue in the book, and I believe that authoritarianism is a great impediment to innovation in um, almost all areas, uh, at least bottom-up innovation. Um, I'll give you a brief sense of how I think about innovation and how I describe it in the book. I describe innovation as a top-down, bottom-up, and outside-in process. Um, it comes from three directions. Um, top-down, all countries invest into R&D and into innovation, right? We have the National Institutes of Health in this country and National Science Foundation. Um, and you will get innovation through investments like watering a plant in priority areas, and China is very clear about its, I think, 11 priority areas. Just read the Premier's work report every March, and it's very clear. The 11 areas China wants to be world leaders in, robotics, medical instruments, solar, and uh, green technology is one of the 11, um, and several others, biotech, nanotech, um, and, and others. But uh, green energy is one of the priorities. So that's an example where an authoritarian system can allocate funds and, and the plant will grow. And China is already a world leader in solar panels and wind, wind turbines and uh, now electric cars and hybrid cars. So this is a good news story. Um, but, uh, and so on that piece of the climate change puzzle, their system is actually good. And indeed, we saw in Paris, and we've seen in the two years since Copenhagen, Xi Jinping and the Chinese government taking some very bold, positive, constructive steps, you know, which they were not doing pre-Copenhagen and at Copenhagen. But now they have. That's good news for the world. We've got an agreement. We wouldn't have had an agreement if the Chinese were not on board with that and didn't work together with the United States on that. Um, and so we need, like everything else in China, implementation. But I think on the, on the climate change innovation piece, that's, authoritarianism is actually not a hindrance. But on other areas of innovation, it is very much a hindrance. It's, China's not going to develop a truly innovative society unless its universities are world class, which it won't happen until it has freedom of speech and thought and uh, breaks a lot of other cultural um, it, uh, impediments to risk taking, right? So if you're going to be an innovative society, you better take risks and not get punished for taking risks. You need to be incentivized to take risks. And if you fail, you won't be slapped on the hand. Now, in China, there are a lot of impediments, some political, some cultural, against risk taking, bottom-up risk taking. You know, you don't have garages in 
Palo Alto, California, or Route 128 corridors in China. You don't have that bottom-up and small business loans and, and tinkerers, and you don't have people in universities who are willing to take risks. Um, and you don't have the outside-in component. Innovation doesn't take place in a single country. It takes place in a global environment today. You have to be linked 24-7, 365 days a year with the, uh, with the world and your professional cohorts around the world. Well, we all know China blocks interactions, electronic and, and human interactions between its citizens and foreigners. So I would say only one of those three pieces of the puzzle, the top-down piece, is in place for innovation. And that's a perfect, probably the best example of the linkage between politics and economic change. If China's going to get through the middle income trap, it has to innovate its way through, and it ain't going to do so unless it politically liberalizes, in my view. Okay, we have uh, four more, four additional questions to follow from the floor. Could I get you to say your name, please? I'm sorry, we yes. introduce, yes. So, right. Alessia Lefebure from Columbia University. Um, I would like to hear you on the disconnect and the extent of the disconnect between Xi Jinping and his elite, because you rem reminded us that this authoritarian period comes after a soft authoritarian period of 10 years, that a lot of returnees are actually people who are in the top elite of the party, of the academia, of intellectuals. So these people today, they seem to hide a little bit themselves. They don't seem to share Xi Jinping position. So to which extent your what you describe is Xi Jinping and not the Chinese Communist Party? Um, how, how isolated he is within the party? Well, I, uh, it's very difficult to measure. Um, this, you know, the Chinese Communist Party goes to extraordinary lengths to make itself opaque and not open to scrutiny or understanding. Uh, it's always been that way. It's gotten much, much, much worse under Xi Jinping. But we can, t you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that this man has consolidated, has centralized uh, power in his own persona to a degree we have not seen since Mao. Okay, and he has therefore broken a three-decade-long um, norm um, that was widely accepted and institutionalized for collective and consensual decision making. Xi Jinping is making all the decisions by himself. And the system, therefore, has frozen up. The think tanks, you know, if you talk to people working in these think tanks, as I do, they aren't being asked to write papers. They're afraid to submit papers because if you say something that's different than what the boss wants to hear, it's the same dynamic as we had in 1958. 59 on the eve of the great in the early phases of the great leap forward so there is a kind of a distortion in to the extent that advice is even being given but my understanding albeit anecdotal is that the advice is not flowing up to the top uh, the consultative dimension of the political system over the last 30 years has broken down she is making all the decisions himself. And then the anti-corruption campaign has so frozen the policy bureaucracies across several areas um, that he's not getting compliance on his directives. And he thinks that he can just order a directive and like under Mao, it will be implemented. China doesn't work like that anymore. And he's learning the age old rule of bureaucratic resistance. If you're a bureaucrat in any system, I dare say maybe even in the Indian system, <laughs> Uh, and you don't agree with the policy that comes from um, th from this, the center, whoever is at the center, your best way of resistance is just inertia, is not acting. You just don't implement it. You don't do anything. You don't openly resist. You don't complain. You just sort of sit on your hands, and you don't do anything. That's what's happening in the Chinese bureaucracy with the economics reform program, I think, to a large extent, plus the culture of fear. People are so afraid they take a step this way that tomorrow the atmosphere will change and then they will be criticized for having done what they did yesterday. So all of this has frozen up the policy system in China <coughs> in a very profound way. And it's having an effect on Xi Jinping's economic reform plan, um, I would argue. Hi, um, my name is Avneet. I work for EIR Publication, founded by Lyndon LaRouche, The Economist. Mm -hmm. My question is about, uh, on this question of innovation, the China Space Program. They recently, on April 29, celebrated National Ch uh, Space Day. And the Chinese Space Program, which is pinnacle, especially by their 
commitment to mine helium-3 on the moon, which is also a commitment by Indian scientists, and, uh, which, and also to fund fusion research, which you know, puts the best of minds uh, at the forefront of your policy making, it, not a bureaucracy, because it doesn't function that way. It's very reminiscent of what America used to be like in 1960s and think like, especially the Apollo missions. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, this Chinese space program and collaboration with other nations, India, Russia, and the United States possibly, do you have any comments on, on that or do you notice any shift in, in the Chinese population because they are very, from as far as I know, very excited about this? You know, China's space program is commendable. Um, it's probably the most active one in the world uh, today. Uh, and it's showing the results of decades, in fact, of investment. Um, it's not something they just came to yesterday. Um, in fact, it dates back uh, to the late 1950s when they began their ballistic missile program and their nuclear weapons program. And countries that have uh, advanced space programs, it generally tends to grow out of ballistic missile and nuclear weapons programs. So China is not exceptional in that regard. Um, but they have, there's, there are a variety of reasons I think they're pursuing it. One is status, right? If you're a global power, you need aircraft carriers and space programs and a few other accoutrements, you know, gold medals at Olympics and so on. Um, so I think there is a status motivation for China's investment in the space program and there are bureaucratic um, motivations too and funding, right? It's the plant. You know, I would put space in the category of the top-down innovation, right? It's just like any of the other 11 priority areas. You water the plant, it'll grow. And they have been showering the space program, which after all is a military program in China. This is not a civilian program in China. So they've been getting good results. They're going to have a man on the moon, they claim, by or a person on the moon by 2020. And they have a Mars program. Um, and the Russians have been very helpful to the Chinese, too. Mind you, the Ch because of the military nature of the program, the Chinese have not had access, to, certainly, to American uh, expertise and technology. They've had some to the French and the Euros Eurospace program, is my understanding. But the Russians have been pretty instrumental. But they've done most of it on their own. So I'm not saying that, you know, I, I think they deserve credit for what they've accomplished. And we've just begun to see see it you know it's not a it's a good news it's a good news story okay yeah we're, we've got we're up to six questions so thanks for keeping them nice and short oh okay. please I just weigh in a little on what you said about india and china collaborating on this issue for a brief period in the 1980s there was some prospect of that uh, actually we when rajiv gandhi the prime minister went to china uh, we signed an agreement for cooperation in the field of peaceful uses of outer space, as it was said. But it didn't really get very far. So the two programs have essentially developed in parallel hmm. and not in conjunction with each other. And today, of course, with the closeness between India and the United States, that's an area of cooperation between our two countries that, mm -hmm. has, that has opened up. Yes. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Nelson Igunma. Um, so, uh, as you were going through your talk, I, I immediately thinking about um, you know developing countries and their growth trajectory in general. I, I couldn't help but think about diasporic communities, especially in cases with you know the Philippines and several African countries that encourage uh, citizens to migrate and send remittances. And even with India, where under the NDA government, there's been a lot of engagement with Indians living abroad. Mm -hmm. um, can you? talk about any insights you gain from Chinese diasporic communities in Southeast Asia, namely the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, um, Malaysia. Um, you know, their political beliefs, their economic engagement with the mainland, their interest um, in, in in getting involved politically, and, and maybe any efforts that have been made or that you anticipate the, the Communist Party making to either engage these communities or neutralize them as a, as a kind of a power base, a, a alternative power base? Sure, it's a, a hugely complex subject, a diaspora of in Southeast Chinese, ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asia, or for that matter, anywhere else on the planet. Um, in Southeast Asia, though, it has some history and some peculiarities, uh, whereby the ethnic Chinese are some of the wealthiest components of those societies. Uh, and they have been seen by their local Southeast Asian governments as a fifth column for the so-called fifth column for the Chinese communist regime in the 1950s and 60s. 
uh, and the, there's a lot of evidence of Chinese communist support for insurgencies uh, in Southeast Asia throughout those decades. The most noteworthy case is, of course, the Indonesian failed Indonesian coup of 1965 and the bloodbath that ensued after that. So there, um, the Chinese then went through a period in the 70s of kind of non-contact, and then in the 80s and the 90s, um, these individuals became very useful to China again, but in a different way, financially. And so China invited remittance, not just remittances, but investment back into China in considerable numbers. And that was in the early waves of FDI into China, that's where it came from before it came from the West or from Japan. Um, since then, uh, my impression is that there's not as much investment by Southeast Asian Chinese diaspora back into China as there used to be, um, and there's greater uh, political distance, shall we say, between Beijing and, and these communities. Um, indeed, there's a greater, and China's also learned the lesson of its inability to kind of politically control these communities. They, these people have, are, don't think of themselves as citizens of the People's Republic of China, first of all, whereas the Chinese government tends to do so. And they aren't uh, attracted to a number of elements of China um, in the way that the government would like to. So it's a complicated story, but there's a greater distance now, I would argue, between ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asia and the so-called motherland. Um, and it's produced some tensions increasing tensions. I'm uh, Bill Armbruster, retired journalist. Uh, getting back to the question that this lady posed uh, mm -hmm. before regarding the re Western educated returnees to China. Have they been leaving China now in the last five or six years because of the re repression? Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't respond to that part of your question. Um, well, there's, we first have to ask ourselves what percentage of Chinese students who go abroad actually do return to China. And there, the Chinese Ministry of Education provides us some very interesting statistics. Sometimes you wonder why the Chinese government offers the world some statistics and why it hides other statistics. Well, in this case, the Ministry of Education, up until two years ago, uh, once they, you know, they have published statistics that show that 70% of Chinese who go abroad for higher education do not return to China. 30% do, starting in 1978. In the last five years, up until the time they stopped giving the statistic in 2013 or 14, uh, it had increased to 40%. So there has been, in fact, an increased percentage uh, that in the 2000s that were going back. But bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, 60% don't go back. Your question, though, is of those who go back, but I think this is an important telling fact, first of all. First, they go out for their educations, and that's quite an indictment, I would say, of the Chinese higher educational system. Then they don't come back. Well, there are a lot of reasons they don't come back, but those that do come back, this is your question, your question, um, are they now trying to get out again? And the answer is yes. They are highly frustrated people. They've been exposed to the world, they've been exposed to the new school, Columbia, other you know, institutions of higher education. They understand how the world works and they are chafing. I know a number of these people. Uh, they're just chafing under the political atmosphere in China today. They can't do their work, they can't invent. Uh, they can't do their research. There's all these political constraints on their research, no matter if they're in physics or in social sciences. So there, that's part of the, there, there's a big pool of these so-called sea turtles, Haigui Pai, who are now going abroad again. Um, we are inundated with visa requests, with foreign visiting scholar requests. And they're going, they're applying for EB-5 visas. Some of these people have money, so they're investing abroad. Um, their parents happen to have money. So there is this net outflow, $950 billion last year from China, um, non-ODI. Non so this is part of the story. And you're, I think you're just going to see increasing um, indications of the, uh, this, of the best and the brightest, the educated elite of China who have been educated abroad, not being content at home and trying to go abroad again. Last factor, when they come back to China, they're not, there are certain careers that are foreclosed to them. For example, a career as a diplomat. I have several students who would love to work for the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Guess what? 
you've been educated abroad in a foreign institution, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs will not employ you because you could be, you've been either indoctrinated or, um, or you, you're a, plant, a CIA plant who will, you know, long-term mole who will somehow come out later. So, you know, that's quite telling. The Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs won't employ students who've been studied abroad. I, I would imagine the uh, Indian Foreign Service doesn't have that prohibition. Well, there is an open examination, no. and if you qualify, you get in. You get in. Yeah. Um, my name is Lei Ping, and I uh, thank you so much for uh, this illuminating talk. And uh, I actually wanted to mention that uh, a lot of my students were here. Uh, we would just actually uh, read your book, Chapters, and um, they had a lot of questions for you. But unfortunately, I'm going to speak for them. Um, I'm a faculty member. I didn't introduce myself uh, here at the New School, and also a scho um, research scholar at the uh, Indian China Institute. Mm -hmm. So I had a question about uh, political adaption that you mentioned, which is uh, a sort of the key link between the political and the economy, uh, sort of in the Chinese economy. And uh, um, you know, judging upon the arguments that you made in the beginning of the book, um, I, I wanted to ask about you know the Huntington model, and is there such a um, you know, direct relation between sort of, uh, you know, past dependency uh, in terms of politically uh, loosening and, you know, liberalizing kind of process that would eventually help uh, China's economy to kind of go back to its own track. And what would you, you know, predict on the future sort of, you know, um, afterlife or life of uh, socialism in this case? Well, um, nice to meet you. I, s I saw your uh, photograph on, and biography on the website of the India China Institute, and I'm delighted to make your acquaintance. But I am not sure I fully understand your question. Um, it's about path dependency, you know. So as I think I, I tried to explain, if you know, path dependency is the easiest um, choice for any any government. Um, in fact, what happened in 2008-9 is an exception. China really went off the the path, the south, soft authoritarian path, and did actually pivot. And there are reasons I explained for why that happened. S and they could pivot again. You know, any of us who study Chinese politics know about something called the Fang Shou Zhou Qi, the cycle of opening and closing. Fang to open, Shou to close. Since 1978 and Deng Xiaoping's ascension to power, China has been through, I think, seven cycles of opening followed by closing. The opening periods last usually six to seven years, and they're followed by two to three years of closing, and then opening starts again. As I say, there have been about six or seven of these cycles going back to 78. I've lived through <laughs> both of them. Um, we are now in year uh, six of or seven of show, of closing. This is an extended period of closing, and China's overdue, one might say, for a return to the opening. But we've had, the point is, there's been this oscillating pattern basically between hard authoritarianism and soft authoritarianism, going back to 1978, right? We had soft authoritarianism all the way up to 89 under Zhao Ziyang and Hu Yaobang, boom. Then it went to hard authority, went to neo-totalitarianism from 89 to 92, and then it reverted briefly to hard authoritarianism until Li Peng was sent into retirement. In 90, and somewhere around 97 or 8, I would argue, the soft, they returned to soft authoritarianism for 10 years, and they went back to hard authoritarianism. The path they've never taken is the semi-democratic path. Zhao Ziyang was on that way in the late 80s. That would have evolved out of soft authoritarianism if Zhao Ziyang had endured and had his way, but it didn't happen. So, you know, if, if that, I'm not sure that was the question you're asking, but there is this kind of cycle um, oscillation pattern that we've seen really for 35 years. Um, but I don't know. I, you know, as much as wishful thinking would like me to say that soft authoritarianism will return, I see no indications in the regime or in Xi Jinping himself that there's an inclination to go there because of what I argued. They believe they cannot control, they cannot manage opening, that it will cascade out of their control and then they'll lose power. And it's all about power. It's not about reform. It's not about opening. It's not about innovation. It's not about all these substantive issues. It's about maintaining the Communist Party in power. Um, and it's a pretty zero, that's why I quoted Brzezinski. It's a pretty zero-sum approach. 
uh, the way that the hard authoritarians define it, zero sum. The soft authoritarians define it in positive sum. You can manage change, and you will stay in power. You will prolong your longevity. That goes back to Huntington. Right? But you have to adapt. You have to go through the J curve and adapt and open. It's a gamble. And you know some authoritarian regimes are willing to take the gamble. This current regime doesn't seem willing to take that gamble. So fine, they don't take the gamble. What does that mean? It means stagnation. Stagnation of a $10 trillion economy. It doesn't mean China's going to collapse. It's going to have solar panel and wind turbine innovation. It's going to have other innovation in the Shenzhen area. It's going to have a lot of things, but it's just it's going to get stuck forever in the middle income trap. OK, down here on the left. Um, I Hi, professors. First, first and foremost, thank you very much for the speech. It's very informative, even to the Chinese people, myself. Uh, my name is Alan Chen. Um, I'm from China. Spent the f past five years in London, in the United Kingdom. Um, currently working for the world's largest investment companies on Wall Street. The mic, um, so I think for my, based on my own experience, both in the EU mm -hmm. and uh, on Wall Street, I can see more business of collaborations, interactions with between the Western companies and the Chinese. However, speaking for uh, the younger generations, I was born after the 1990s, um, I, can, I can't really see that many Chinese folks in the audience. So that says something, especially we have so many Chinese students in, in the city. And yeah. <laughs> I guess that brings up a question in terms of the implementations of the changes the Chinese government want to make. Okay, so speaking of economics, mm -hmm. Chinese debt problem is so obvious. We have two, the debt to GDP ratio is around 284%. And um, then Clear. the younger generations, they lack the enthusiasm to change the world, right? And at the same time, we have these debt problems. So at some point, the economic conditions will affect their daily lives. However, the younger generations, they are not willing to act on it. So my question will be, to what extent you think the government will be forced to implement new policies that might, might not be adopted by the younger generations, or they will implement more stimulus or incentives to allow more younger generations to go abroad. However, like you said, most of them, maybe like myself, we don't want to return to China. So there's a dilemmas over there. So is there a way out of that? Well, in some, I thank you for your question. Um, I think in some ways you've answered your own question, though. You, you voted with your feet. You're working on Wall Street. You're not working in Beijing. So you know that just proves the thesis. Um, in many ways. I'm not blaming you for that. If I was a young Chinese and had a chance to work on Wall Street, I'd work on Wall Street instead of Zhong Sun any day. Um, I'm not being facetious. You know, there are real reasons not to want to work in China. And those who have returned, the 40%, are highly frustrated. They have all these advanced skills that they acquired abroad through very hard work and study, and they're not able to use them domestically. And so the opportunity, the relative, you know, cost uh, relative opportunities are much better abroad. China, by the way, is not unique in this regard. If you look at South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Iran, other uh, developing countries in Malaysia for a while, um, at a st that's this stage of development when authoritarian political systems were so repressive domestically and wages were not, hadn't risen to a comfortable level, um, the, intel the educated classes left the country. Right? And then when wages reach a level combined with political openness, I'm not going to use the word democracy, but you can have liberalization and political openness, then the, the attractiveness to return home increases. And you will see this with China. So your question is, what's going to incentivize the regime to change course, to incentivize people like yourself to go back? I mean, I'd like to answer you to answer your own question. Um, I suspect many Chinese are never going to go back be honest with you, because they've seen the last 60 years of oscillation, capriciousness, the, the government changing from one day to the next, one month to the next, one year to the next. They can't be, tr they cannot trust the future, you know? I think there's a, a, a high degree of apprehension in China 
um, about uh, the future, you know, and hence a kind of Hobbesian society. Take what you can get today because you may not have it tomorrow. Somebody's going to take it away from you tomorrow. The government may take it away or there will be some campaign, some yundung that comes along or you'll, you'll be an anti-corruption campaign or your foreign assets will be frozen or something might happen. You know, there's just, um, there's a lot of, of distrust in Chinese society and that's a kind of cancer of its own. You know, and amnesia, I would argue, too, but that's another story. Here we have, in, in a week or so, the 50th anniversary of the Cultural Revolution. One of the more significant events in 20th century history, and certainly in China's history. What is the Chinese government going to say about it? We'll wait and see. On June, on May 25th, the anniversary of Nei Yuanzi's Da Zibao at Beida, I suspect it'll just go right by, the Chinese government won't say a word about it. Why? Well, it's doesn't want to open that Pandora's box, but there are many other Pandora boxes. This is a, a, a state, and unfortunately a society, suffering from collective amnesia, enforced amnesia. And you can't have a, build a future for any society, I would argue, uh, if you don't have honesty about the past. All right. Uh, we ha we're speaking of future. Our future is limited. And uh, we, ha we have five questions from people who've been waiting very patiently. Would you, would you want to take two or three sure. in batches? Okay, so we'll start here, and then, uh, then I'll direct it back to, to you who've been waiting next. Yes. Uh, Gabriel Avgerinos, Energy Mentors International. Um, in view of the comments that you made about uh, hard authoritarianism, <laughs> and in view of what we've just heard over the last month, from China here in the US, which mm. might be filtered. Uh, the question is, we've heard about the coal program that was permitted in a very big way in 2015, as much as 170 gigawatts of new coal power plant generation. And almost within a week, it was very quickly in the New York Times talked back by the authorities, no, 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 this is just uh, the plants that were already licensed or are under construction, but we're not going to continue, et cetera, et cetera. Keeping in mind that that is really the hard authorities speaking, because mm. it's a lot of government owned, versus the, at the same time almost, announcements about solar and clean renewables. Mm -hmm. What are we to believe? Are they both going on? Or is one a little bit of lip service on a small basis, and the other one is the big Magilla that's continuing? Well, I'm not an, a specialist in Chinese energy issues, or for that matter, environmental issues. Um, you know, but I think the way you ended your question is probably the answer to your question. It's both. It's not either or. And I think you inferred that the big part of that is the coal part. The small part is the renewables part. Um, you know, China has the world's largest uh, coal reserves. That's not going to change. And until, and they're doing all kinds of things with nuclear as well, building, what, 18 or 20 power plants at the moment. Um, so, you know, we'd love China to wean itself from the fossil, from, from its coal burning. I remember <laughs> as a student living in China in the early 1970s and, and 80s, uh, you couldn't breathe because of coal. You know, it's different different reasons in some ways today. But other than I think it's, you know, it's it's a challenge. And beyond that, I'm not sure what, what to say. Okay, again, let's, um, let's try uh, to uh, th thank you. quick questions uh, and then you sure. can answer uh, two or okay, three. I'll with take, with take these three take, together, maybe. Take them, yeah, take them together. Well, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and America asserting its power in the South China Sea, could we stumble into a hot war? Okay, and then back here to Matt. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shamba, for the great talk. Uh, my name is Matt Longman. I'm an undergrad at uh, the new school at Eugene Lang. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to formulate this question. Uh, I'll try to keep it as concise and clear as I can. Um, just in terms of a competing uh, 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 notion to the notion of power for power's sake, um, it seems to me that there's a history, or maybe put uh, better, a commitment that uh, the history of the Chinese Revolution through the Maoist period and, to the, and through the period of reform um, has, uh, has been oriented around a commitment for Chinese ascendancy, a new period of Chinese ascendancy in relation to its you know, longer history. Mm -hmm. 
and that the motivation for the hard authoritarian factions within the CCP, exemplified by Xi Jinping, um, could be oriented or, or could be in the you know uh, in light of the you know the leaps and bounds that China's economic development has made over the last 20 years since the period of reform or 30 years since the period of reform, uh, that they are sort of bound to that responsibility towards Chinese ascendancy and that the authoritarianism might come out of a place rather than power for power's sake, but actually um, a place that sees authoritarianism as the necessary um, orientation, political orientation to achieve uh, to achieve like a Chinese nationalist ascension in the face of what otherwise would be a pluralistic, open, global economy um, subject to capital and all of that. So, thank you. Okay, and can we get to, to Li Bo and then a couple of others if we have time after the response, you, you too. Thank you. Uh, my name is Li Bo, I'm the f uh, fellow of uh, Indian China Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, given your analysis of um, different camps during Jiang Zemin's mm -hmm. time, particularly you mentioned Zhang Qinghong. Mm -hmm. Could I assume if history could be rewinded and the Xi, uh, the current regime is not headed, was not headed by someone like Xi, and, and, um, it, it would be something like Jiang Zemin. Would you be willing to say that um, um, China would head for semi democracy pathway easily? Because you t certainly seem to suggest that Jiang uh, Zheng Qinghong is more uh, open to change and uh, uh, incremental changes. Uh, and, the, uh, and also I would like to ask you um, your ultimate question, the assumption that uh, it, whether ch China will head that way depends on how open, uh, the openness of the CCP regime. Um, could I sort of turn, around, turn that around a little bit and ask you, uh, given your lots of knowledge of, on China, uh, can you um, imagine like what are the triggers um, that would force that, op uh, that openness CCP needs? Okay. okay, let's get answers and if there's time we'll have the last two questions. Okay. Um, so on your uh, first one about the South China Sea, um, uh, could the United States stumble into a hot war with China in the South China Sea? Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, we could, and we should not be afraid of it, uh, in my view. Um, uh, you know, there are a uh, number of claimants to those islands. The United States is not a claimant but one of those countries that are claimants is a ally of the United States, the Philippines. And in the East China Sea, Japan uh, is the administrator of the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, and the United States has made very clear that since Japan administrates those islands, the alliance with Japan applies to them. So, you know, it's, it, the United States has made very clear, President Obama himself and Ash Carter and John Kerry and many other American officials that indeed uh, these, uh, if there is a uh, military clash over these islands, um, that the United States stands with its allies. So that's the first question, uh, or first answer to your question, I should say. Uh, we'll be, it'll be very interesting to see how the International Tribunal on the Hague rules in the next few weeks, but if it rules as everybody expects it to rule, um, that's only going to increase the tensions in the area. Ch mind you, ch you know, everybody's increasing tensions. The Chinese are increasing the tensions through their island building and the militarization of those islands. You know, we'll have fighter wings on those islands. We're gonna have, we had China's second largest destroyer just three days ago go into one of those islands. We're gonna have Chinese submarines going into those harbors before long. And I would not at all be surprised if we woke up one morning, opened the newspaper and China had proclaimed an air defense identification zone over the South China Sea. All real possibilities, all escalatory, aggravating possibilities by China. Now, the United States also, one must say, is contributing to the escalation of tensions uh, through our freedom of navigation operations. I'm fully in favor of freedom of navigation operations. We should be doing them. We should be challenging China's claimed sovereignty over these 
rocks that are becoming islands. That's the issue. It's all very, the South China Sea is an incredibly complex story, but you ask, can we stumble into a hot war with China? Uh, yeah, we can. Um, and it's, it, we should be aware of it and should be conscious of, of it, and we should not um, shy away from it because of the possibility, you know? I didn't. Well, why do you think they would escalate to a thermonuclear conflict? We are building nuclear bases. Um, the United States is escalating nuclear conflict in the South China Sea. How? Well, if you look at the bases being built, and what bases? The South being in the Philippines and Northern Australia. There are no American nuclear weapons bases in Australia or the Philippines. Yeah. No, they're not. <laughs> um, not at all. Um, so, you know, there is this pot. We, we need to move on to the next. So the other I think it's just preposterous to suggest we should this World War III to work violence. I'm not suggesting we should. World War III will be a consequence of a clash over an island. You know, your leap from that to the thermonuclear Armageddon, I'd like to know how you get from there to there. The we can talk about that. Maybe we should discuss there's that. No, there's no reason for you to assume that. Because a territorial dispute is a territorial dispute, and you have, may have an escalation of tension. You may have an occasional, perhaps even a skirmish, but that need not escalate into a thermonuclear sure. conflict. You're talking of responsible countries. Like Every country. country. Yeah. No, but that, that is, uh, that's a different change, a different you know, we're not, we're not in, I don't think that set of circumstances operates today. And look at us in the region, look at you know, countries like India, we would by no means want an escalation of conflict to that level. We would like uh, tensions to be diffused. So, um, <laughs> moving on to the second question. Um, your question in the back about uh, China's ascendancy narrative and whether authoritarianism is a successful pathway to achieving that um, China dream, you might say, if I could rephrase your question. First, I'd point out the ascendancy narrative goes back to the 1870s and the self-strengthening movement of the Qing dynasty. This is not any, it's not a new narrative. Every Chinese leadership since um, the late Qing and, and um, Li Hong Zhang has articulated that narrative. The latest iteration is Xi Jinping's China dream. Uh, the word rejuvenation they use, Fuxing, mm -hmm. uh, repeatedly. That's not Xi Jinping's term, that's Jiang Zemin's term. So the narrative hasn't changed at all. Your question though is about whether the Chinese authoritarian regime will be successful in achieving that rejuvenation as a global power. My argument tonight and in the book is no, very clearly, it will not. It will stagnate and have all kinds of problems. They will have much better chances if they open their political system of achieving that ascendancy. Um, third question about uh, Jiang Zemin, I mean, and, and uh, what would be the trigger for a return to soft authoritarianism? It's ironic that we look back now on the Jiang Zemin period and the first part, first half or two thirds really of the Hu Jintao era as a reformist, politically reformist period. It was though, you know, remember the three represents, which is a very progressive concept for a communist party. Um, inner party reform, uh, competitive elections within the party, not, not just on the government side. They were, they were experimenting with those in the party. Opening media, greater tolerance for intellectual freedom. There are a lot of things going on during Jiang Zemin, early Hu Jintao that one looks back on um, and admires. Uh, what would it require to return to that? Um, a change at the top, you know. The, unfortunately, China is still a leader-driven society. And unless there is a change at the party congress or Xi Jinping is overthrown somehow or has a change of heart and an epiphany and wakes up tomorrow saying, oh gosh, you know, the last four years is not a pathway forward. We got to change. After, you know, hopefully he'll get a chance to read my book. <laughs> then um, change is only going to, in these types of systems, if you look at them, they all change comes from above. It doesn't come from below. It uh, comes from, uh, the openings are created from above and then the society comes forth. That's what happened in Taiwan, that's what happened in South Korea, that's what happens in Southeast Asia, that's what happens in Latin America and other authoritarian regimes. But if the regime doesn't 
open or give the society the chance to move forward and for foreign for for citizens who are resident abroad to return home and contribute to that nation building then it's not going to happen because we started late chairman mark says we have just five more minutes so in the back uh, could you please ask a question and then here he's been waiting sure. very patiently very short and then we'll yeah wrap. my name is being I'm a faculty at the uh, brook college city in new york i remember the first book i wrote, uh, wrote it wrote written about it uh, Beautiful imperialism, China <laughs> yes. perceive America. My question back to this book again. Now, after 30 years, how do you think uh, China perceive Americans? Still as a beautiful imperialist or something else? <laughs> I'm so pleased to hear that. Uh, let me take the sec last question and then um, I'll try and respond together. Sure. Uh, Gabor Grubach, uh, data analyst at Vanek, and the short question is uh, so you quoted 13 out of 25 turnover at the Politburo. Was that? Correct. Uh, uh, yeah, thirteen million. And do you ex what do you expect from that turnover? Okay. Uh, well, on the the beautiful imperialist question, um, which was my um, actually my second book, my but it was my doctoral dissertation, and it was a study of China's America watchers and their views of the U.S. And I found that they had very ambivalent views of the United States. And Malcolm will remember that. Um, um, Martin will remember that. We were studying together at Peking University at the time I was researching that. Um, so beautiful imperialists tried to capture the ambivalence the Chinese feel about the U.S. You know, it's a, and it's a literal translation of Mei Guo or Mei Di, right? So Mei Di. Um, so Chinese have always been ambivalent about the United States and they continue to be. Uh, and that would continue today. You know, they all want to come here to study. They all want to, you know, open up bank accounts here, buy property here, send their relatives here. But they are the first to condemn the United States for its foreign policy behavior, its inner city uh, conditions, its crime, its all the all the various problems we have in the U.S., of which we have many. Um, so there is this. But what has shifted is the degree of admiration. Back in the 1980s, when China was first opening. There was an extraordinary admiration for the United States that um, I think has really kind of ended. And it ended in the 90s. It ended after Tiananmen. It ended after the Belgrade bombing. Um, it ended, there are a lot of things that took place between the US and China. The rose wore off of the Chinese image of the US. And it was no longer the you know, shining city on the hill. Um, that it once was. In other words, the United States is no longer a kind of source of inspiration, certainly political inspiration, to China. Uh, it's a practical place for people to go, right? Get their education, get their bank accounts, get their, their family members out of the country. Um, so there's still an ambivalence, but I don't think the United States is admired today nearly as much in China as it was in the 1980s. Similarly, in the United States, the rose has also the bloom has also gone off the rose. Americans don't admire and respect China as we have previously, either. There are a lot of reasons for this. Um, it's not good news, but it's reality. Um, and then uh, last question is about the Politburo ch turnover in the next Congress. Uh, well, as I indicated. You know, th 13 of the 25 Politburo members will have to retire. That leaves 12 of them in place. Not all 12, but seven or eight of them have very progressive records. That is at least a constituency to return to the soft authoritarian model. All of those people, Wang Yang um, comes to mind. Uh, the, Hu Chunhua. Hmm? Hu Chunhua, uh, the, um, the current vice president of the country. Um, Anyway, there are there are seven or eight, as I say, that uh, would um, who would be advocates of returning to soft authoritarianism. But then you have the th replacement of the thirteen. Who are those going to be? And that's an open question. We don't know. Are they going to be Xi Jinping acolytes? And then there are some Xi Jinping acolytes, but not many. Two or three. I can name their names: Li Jiangshu, Ding Xiang. Um, maybe one other in individual who you can call a Xi Jinping man. So it's the odd thing about Xi Jinping, he's a very, very, very strong leader, but he has no clients. This is a man who has risen to the top, but without a factional network underneath him. This is very risky in Chinese politics. Um, 
So he doesn't, and, and his anti-corruption campaign has alienated so many elites in the party, in the government, in the corporate world, and in the military, where 4,000 officers and 82 generals have been brought down in the anti-corruption campaign. You don't, he has smashed a lot of rice bowls. And he doesn't have a lot of, he doesn't have a client base that is ready to just step up and move into place. So this is a very odd dynamic. And, um, sorry? Well, in some ways it is, um, yeah. Uh, and there may, you know, it's very hard to speculate about. You know, maybe his hand will be forced by this reformist soft authoritarian group and the failure of his authoritarian path. At some point in time, people are gonna say, excuse me, President Xi, we have uh, GDP, you know, debt ratios of 282%, our growth rate is falling, we have overcapacity, and we're not implementing the third plenum reforms, and your one belt, one road policy doesn't seem to be going too far. Uh, you know, he's got to deliver. And thus far, he's not doing a whole lot of delivering. So this is what we call performance-based legitimacy. This system is based on performance-based legitimacy and nationalism. So um, I don't know. So that could change the dynamic two years hence. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. You know, that's what makes China, maybe end on this note, China watching <laughs> so interesting. Is it so unpredictable? <laughs> on that note, let's thank our speaker, Professor Shambaugh, and our commentator, Ambassador Ralph. <laughs>